I'm a modern China historian, and in particular, I f I'm interested in the period, the early 20th century, when China moves from uh, the late imperial period into the modern period, so when it becomes a modern nation state. Chen Jiexian uh, caught my eye because he's well known uh, for his writings, his novel writings. He's actually a romance novelist, um, so he wrote uh, wonderful uh, stories uh, about love um, in, uh, in the early 20th century. They were known as uh, Mandarin Duck and Butterfly fiction. Uh, they were very melodramatic. Uh, readers were meant to weep along with him and so on and so forth as he narrated his stories. And so initially I knew of him as this kind of uh, sort of sappy writer. Um, and one day I was just in the library looking at uh, a magazine from the 1910s. It was called The Women's World. Uh, women's journals were uh, very popular at the time and they were uh, journals that um, introduced a lot of new knowledge um, and, and that included uh, science and technology. And in The Women's World, which happened to be uh, edited by uh, Chen Diexian, I saw this column uh, that was on how to manufacture cosmetics as a genteel woman in your home. This column uh, was targeting purportedly women writers, um, but as I investigated a little bit more, uh, I realized it wasn't just women writers and readers who were reading the column, but also men and would-be manufacturers. Um, so, so it was a kind of a curious moment where uh, Chen and, and men and women like him were kind of in the world of letters exploring science and technology. So I, it, that was my aha moment. I said, oh, this is kind of an interesting guy who can let me look uh, at this transitional period when um, boundaries between social occupation, boundary, boundaries between fields of knowledge was quite fluid. Chen Diexian was certainly a man of his time. Um, I would not say that he was unprecedented. There were moments throughout Chinese history where uh, uh, especially transition moments where uh, entrepreneurial figures could take advantage of chaos and disarray in order to make money or to dabble in new kinds of endeavors. What's interesting about the late Qing, early 20th century moment is that this was a period also of industrialization. It was also a period when China was very weak. Um, there were imperialist powers on the ground that were uh, forcing China to compromise its sovereignty. So there was a real sense of uh, China um, emerging, into, emerging in the modern world as a weak player um, as the Qing dynasty was in decline. And um, the foreign presence also meant that there were new forms of technology and industry being imported. and. Um, uh, that said, uh, the Chinese were hardly passive players in the adaptation of foreign knowledge. Um, and that is actually a very important goal of my book, is to show how um, Chen Diexian and others like him were actually uh, active brokers in managing new information, new uh, uh, forms of technology that were circulating into China. Um, you know, past scholars have tended to portray men like uh, Chen as being mired in texts, mired in textual knowledge and Confucianism, and not able to think about the uh, pragmatic forms of knowledge that was necessary for a modern industrialized nation. Um, what I'm finding with Chen was that he was, uh, in fact, highly able to leverage his classical education, his literary background, to find success in industry and commerce. He wasn't alone in kind of being able to, to be entrepreneurial um, during this period uh, and span uh, different fields of knowledge. And this was actually very, very important um, for his ability to succeed and for China's ability to succeed in modern day capitalism. Um, and that's something that is very central to my book. I'm very interested in understanding how this generation was able to leverage its resources and its skills that they had accrued in the late Qing to become very, very successful um, in uh, business and commerce uh, at the global level. So vernacular industrialism is in the title of the book, and it's a central concept in my book as well. Um, it uh, comes initially from, I was inspired by a, an actual term uh, in Chinese, which is xiao gong yi. 
uh, which means light manufacturing. It can be translated in multiple ways. Light manufacturing. Um, it can. One might also even say it's trivial industrial arts. Um, but this term xiao gong yi was the field in which Chen Jiexian uh, was um, flourishing. A lot of um, foreign uh, merchants and capitalists were on the ground in China. Um, and uh, oftentimes outmaneuvering native Chinese um, manufacturers. Um, so it was not a particularly conducive time to build industry, certainly not heavy industry. So, and there was very little state support. Um, so uh, entrepreneurial types like Chen uh, engaged in this light industry, light manufacturing, this xiaogong yi field, because that didn't require a lot, right? To make, um, you know, face powder, uh, all you had to do was kind of mix, you know, calcium carbonate with a couple other um, um, ingredients together. He was, his, the product he was most known for was uh, the butterfly brand tooth powder that could double as face powder. It was a dual functioning um, uh, cosmetic item and, and it was very, very easy to manufacture. Uh, what he also had to do, however, was he had to manufacture the raw ingredients because even raw ingredients were not uh, always available. And so he did it through um, very innovative ways. Uh, he would first translate the recipes, often from abroad and, and different languages. He would translate them into Chinese. Uh, so he would pr procure the no knowledge from abroad. This kind of tinkering and this kind of do-it-yourself DIY ethos is at the core of his light manufacturing endeavors and at the core of what I call vernacular industrialism. Uh, and vernacular industrialism for me is, is not necessarily a literal, it wasn't a term of the day, it's a conceptual term that I'm coming up with in order to capture the kind of um, innovative engagement, the DIY ethos, the kind of localist, nativist approach of industry building that uh, people like Chen Jiexian had to engage in, um, given the sort of uh, not so ideal conditions of industry building that existed in China at the time. In China, there's long been a recognition of the need to um, be able to emulate uh, in order to innovate. Um, and this is in the artistic traditions. Um, this comes out of manufacturing traditions where apprenticeship is very important. Transmission of knowledge is done through emulating the master. Um, and so this was certainly uh, something that is a long history that you can identify within the Chinese context. In the uh, 19th century, um, this uh, idea of copying technologies from abroad actually became celebrated uh, in the self, something known as a self-strengthening movement that took place in the late 19th century, which was state-sponsored. There was this entire push to uh, promote th this idea of fangzhi, to emulate from, you know, at, to strategically emulate a manufacturer, uh, guides out to remake um, technologies from abroad. Uh, Chen Jiexian, by the um, 20th century, um, fast forward about 50 years, um, updates this discourse on uh, strategic emulation within the context of the national products movement. Right, so he is actually a leader of this nativist manufacturing movement in the 1930s, well, spanning the 19 you know, tends to the 1930s, where uh, nativist manufacturers promoted um, the manufacturing of pure Chinese goods. The enemy product was um, foreign commodities made by the Japanese or the British imperialists. And as a architect of this movement, he promoted the uh, idea of ripping them off in order to produce nativist goods that are cheaper but better in quality. He actually advocated the need for uh, copying, um, emulating, adapting foreign technology. And this was a period when globally uh, uh, intellectual property was not yet fixed. Um, so it wasn't just happening in China. Um, uh, but uh, there were really, but what the Chinese case does show is on the ground that the Chinese were quite good at copying and, and this copying oftentimes led to innovation. Um, and so this vernacular industrialism concept is also meant to kind of conceptualize 
practices of industry uh, industry making that kind of fall outside of kind of the Euro-American experience and kind of think about how industrialization took place on the ground in China uh, on its own terms um, in ways that are sometimes not always um, acceptable by sort of Western uh, conceptions. So he wouldn't be the first at all, the first copier in Chinese history. Um, and, and I think he is a, of a long line of very savvy copiers uh, in Chinese history who have uh, whose um, strategic ability to emulate and adapt foreign technologies has allowed China to compete on, on the world stage. And we see that today in, uh, as China emerges um, in the 21st century as a global superpower. Uh, one of the ways it's been able to do so is by uh, being quite savvy in its production of all kinds of goods. Chinese copying is um, something that I'm this book wants to both understand historically, but also reject, uh, in the sense that I don't think copying only takes place in China. <laughs> there is counterfeiting throughout the world. I think uh, my third project actually deals with the making of the Chinese copycat uh, and how China emerges um, in the global discourse as a quintessential copier. But Chinese actors historically are not the only ones that copy. I will say that historically, the understanding of innovation um, in China might be different from the modern enlightenment notion of, of invention um, or, or even authorship. Um, so the notion of the singular author, the singular inventor is a very modern notion. It comes out of the European enlightenment, right? Um, if you actually look at even in practices in Europe or in America, creativity is, is, is collaborative. It's, it's, it's never a singular uh, author or inventor.